Good morning. It's Thursday, the 26th of October in London. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Europe podcast. I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, Israeli troops make incursions into Gaza as Netanyahu talks ground invasion preparations. Shares in Standard Chartered drop as the lender reveals its China challenges. And fourth time lucky, Republicans elect a little-known Trump ally as the next House Speaker. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. Israel's military has said it made limited ground raids inside northern Gaza overnight to attack Hamas targets before withdrawing. It's the latest in a series of small incursions that may also be aimed at rescuing hostages and gathering intelligence and comes as Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the country is getting ready for a ground invasion. His words are spoken through a translator. All Hamas militants are doomed above the earth, underground, within Gaza and outside of Gaza. Netanyahu's comments came after the US President Joe Biden said he'd asked Israel to delay an invasion of Gaza so that more hostages held by Hamas could be freed. The two leaders spoke by phone again on Wednesday. The United Nations says its shelters have been overwhelmed by almost 600,000 Palestinians who fled their homes in the territory. European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde says the battle against inflation isn't over, but she's confident it can be won. Speaking to Greek television ahead of today's ECB policy meeting in Athens, Lagarde said, quote, we are not done yet, adding officials must be very attentive to the risks. Despite the hawkish rhetoric, the Central Bank is today expected to hold rates steady at 4%. The pause would be the first in over a year. We'll bring you the decision live here on Bloomberg at 1.15pm London time. Shares in Standard Chartered have fallen in Hong Kong after the bank reported lower than expected profits and charges related to investments in China. Pre-tax profits at the Asia-focused bank fell by 2% to $1.32 billion in the third quarter. CFO Andy Halford wants investors to see past these numbers to the outlook. Look at what we're saying about the outlook. It is exactly the same as what we were saying before. We still think we can get the same top line growth this year. We still think we can get the same top line growth next year. We still think we can get the roti up to double digits this year and up to 11% next year. There will be a lot of focus upon the NIM, which was a little bit weaker today, but it is one component of many. The rest of the business is really performing very strongly. Now, Halford pointed to brighter spots like operating income, which rose by 6% in the quarter, driven by an increase in lending income and wealth management. But provisions for loan losses increased, reflecting the uncertain trajectory of China's economy. BNP Paribas has added to the list of European banks underperforming their Wall Street counterparts. Weaker than expected fixed income revenue saw bond, the bond trading unit earn 12% less than last year. But the bank's CFO, Lars Machinil, told Bloomberg that they're still well placed for the coming year. Also, look at pre-tax income in the quarter, up 7%. If you look year to date, bottom line up 9%. If you add the share buyback that we've been doing, yeah. earnings per share up 15%. So don't zoom in on one thing which was impacted by a high level of last year. Look at what we're doing in our diversified way, standing by our clients. And you can hear that full interview with the CFO of BNP Paribas, Lars Machinil, on the Bloomberg Talks podcast. The bank's overall net income came in at 2.66 billion euros, missing estimates. Its shares down almost 4% in early trading in Paris. Ted Pick will become Morgan Stanley's new CEO. He succeeds James Gorman after a 14-year run that reshaped the US bank in the wake of the financial crisis. More now from Bloomberg's Charlie Pellet. Pick is a three-decade veteran of the firm and co-president. In a statement, the bank said he will be elevated to the top role in January and join the board. The 65-year-old Gorman will stay on as executive chairman. In tapping Pick, the firm is turning to the man credited with spurring a revival in its trading business after a perilous stretch during the 2008 financial crisis, a period when clients ditched Morgan Stanley and doubts about its ability to survive reverberated around Wall Street. Street. In New York, Charlie Pellet, Bloomberg Radio. Shares in Meta slid on after hours trading after the social media giant's CFO Susan Lee said the revenue outlook is uncertain for the next year. The comments put a damper on an otherwise upbeat earnings report. The revenue is higher than expected. Meta shares initially climbed but then slid by more than 3% in extended trading. 
And to US politics now, after 22 days, 14 candidates and four nominees, the House of Representatives has a new speaker. In the end, Republicans voted unanimously to install a little-known Trump ally in the post. Louisiana Congressman Mike Johnson was a prominent supporter of efforts to overturn Joe Biden's 2020 election victory. Here's what he told the House after his election. They have been watching this drama play out for a few weeks. We've learned a lot of lessons, but you know what? Through adversity, it makes you stronger. And yeah, and, and we want our allies around the world to know that this body of lawmakers is reporting again to our duty stations. Let the enemies of freedom around the world hear us loud and clear. The People's House is back in business. Johnson is an outspoken opponent of same-sex marriage and a fervent advocate for cutting government spending. Well, let's turn to the Middle East now, the latest developments there overnight. The US President asking Israel to delay a ground invasion of Gaza to allow for talks over the release of, of hostages. Benjamin Netanyahu, though, reiterating his country was preparing a ground offensive as the uh, Israeli military has said that it carried out some limited incursions into northern Gaza overnight. Our head of Middle East and North Africa, Stuart Livingston Wallace, joins us now for more on this. Stuart, good morning to you. Can you just first of all start by by taking us through these latest developments, what we heard from the Israeli military about uh, limited raids they carried out in Gaza? Yeah, good morning, Stephen. Yeah, so I mean, this was a discussion we had this morning about how do we differentiate between sort of a limited incursion and a ground war because they, they, on the face of it, look quite similar. I mean, so for instance, the limited incursions included tanks, um, which I think most of us would think of as a ground war. But I I, I think the way we're interpreting it as... a ground war would look like is obviously a much larger operation and an operation that's intended to not only take territory but then control it. Uh, Whereas I think what we have seen this time is sort of, uh, I hesitate to describe it as a quick in and out, but that's kind of what it looks like. You know, it has a very specific target and then there's a retreat after that once once that objective is, is achieved. So, um, I mean, in terms of the sort of the latest developments on the diplomatic front, which I think uh, is what everyone's got their eye on, obviously we did have Biden uh, come out and say that he has at least requested um, that they hold off on a, a ground war proper until they can make some headway on the hostage issue. That's number one. There's still more than 200 hostages in Gaza, as far as we're aware, and they have been trickling out at a very, very small, um, uh, a very low rate. You know, I think we've had four so far. Uh, secondly, to give the U.S. a chance to move more equipment and personnel into the region to protect its own assets because we have seen a a pickup in drone and rocket attacks on U.S. military bases, primarily in Iraq and Syria. But again, remember that the U.S. has bases all over the Middle East uh, that need protecting. And then thirdly, the issue of humanitarian aid. So again, we've seen a trickle of aid come in from Egypt across that Rafah border crossing into southern Gaza, but it's nowhere near the volume uh, needed to meet the demands of the size of the population that you have in Gaza, which is sort of a couple of million people. And of course, the the discussions at the UN Security Council had been central to the the diplomatic wrangling we were talking about 24 hours ago, but that actually continued on Wednesday to still no agreement on a resolution for a humanitarian pause or a ceasefire or anything that would allow more aid to be brought into Gaza. Yeah, and I and I think that's sort of a, a good example of, of basically they're not really getting anywhere at the UN. We saw earlier in the week, you know, a very tense moment where the Secretary General made a statement about the situation that was met with absolute fury by the Israelis with a demand for the Secretary General's resignation. There was sort of this tit for tat where various sides were trying to get a resolution across and they were just being repeatedly vetoed. Um, Now, I am not a UN expert, but uh, it sure looks like we're not really going to get a great deal of action from the UN that will have any impact on what's happening on the ground. What about the perceptions regionally? A lot of attention being paid to comments by Queen Rania of Jordan criticising Israel's response to the Hamas attacks. Yeah, I mean, I think that speaks to really a, a division that we've seen emerge in terms of the international stance on what, what is happening. And I think that maybe it's no great surprise that Middle Eastern leaders have felt obliged to become ever more vociferous about the humanitarian situation. In some respects, that's a reflection of the sort of the popular sentiment, I would say, amongst the populations of the Middle East. But beyond that, the division... 
has really sort of come down to context and how how these events are being described. So certainly within Israel, the context is very much one of um, you know centuries and centuries and centuries of, of very difficult times and genocide and so on. And the context within the Arab world has become one of what's happened maybe in more recent decades in that specific area. And and that's really where we're seeing sort of the differentiation between between it. But um, again, no easy way of seeing how you resolve that tension. No, indeed. And something that we'll be monitoring closely as those diplomatic uh, efforts continue for now. Stuart Ivingston Wallace, our head of Middle East and North Africa, thank you very much for bringing us up to date on that story. Let's turn now to the latest earnings reports from the technology sector. Shares in Facebook's parent company Meta slid in after hours trading on Wall Street after its CFO said the revenue outlook for next year was uncertain. Let's bring in Matt Bloxham now from Bloomberg Intelligence for more. So, with Meta, it was interesting because their results did actually beat expectations mm-hmm. uh, for the latest quarter, but it was these comments about the future that seems to have caught the attention of investors. Yeah, that's right. Q3 revenues up 23.5%, which was almost doubling on the previous quarter's growth. So um, seeing, you know, and they, they make all their money from advertising. So, you know, brands really putting their money to work. Um, but yeah, uh, not surprisingly, like many companies, doubts about what's going to happen next year, given everything going on in the economy and uh, macro uh, geopolitical issues. Um, so, you know, I, I think that spooked investors, particularly when you put it together with the plan to continue invest aggressively uh, in their metaverse uh, vision, um, which, you know, generates no revenue really and huge losses for them uh, and also is planning to spend a lot more on capital investment really to kind of fund technology in their data centers partly around the metaverse but also around the investment in AI so I think that you know, kind of combination of perhaps a weaker than expected revenue outlook and continued high spending on you know kind of uh, mid to long term kind of moonshot projects um, uh, really spook people I wonder how much we can tie that into what we've heard from WPP the advertising giant this morning as well. I mean, its shares falling, they're down about 2.6% now, so pairing some of the earlier losses as well. But they cut again their outlook for revenue growth yeah. too. Yeah, I, I think um, some of what's going on at WPP is company specific. They've chosen a very different strategy to some of their peers. Uh, and they're also actually relatively weak in the US market, which continues to be the, the kind of strongest market for, for kind of ad revenue, which is kind of what drove Meta uh, in, in Q3. But but, you know, there is a kind of broader you know, set of concerns here that, you know, brand spending into 2024 is going to come under pressure um, because they're going to cut back to the, the, the doubts about what's going on. And so that, that that's kind of a general theme, I think, across all these kind of ad related businesses. Yeah, it was interesting. With WP actually citing continued cutbacks from technology clients as being part of the reason that they led them to revise down their outlook too. If we look ahead, then the next big name to report, Amazon, what should mm-hmm. we be watching out for with them? Yeah, so th- I think the big focus there is on the the Amazon Web Services business, which is their market leading cloud business. That's what generates all of the profit for for Amazon. So I think you know, the expectations there are for whether they can kind of hold the kind of double digit growth they saw last quarter in that business. That would be a positive sign if they can. Obviously, they're benefiting from the investments corporates are making in AI too. But obviously, there'd be spill across into their own fledgling advertising business, which is starting to encroach on the likes of uh, Meta and Google. Uh, uh, and obviously what's going on in their kind of online retail business and what they're saying about the, the health of the, the, the global consumer um, into Q4 and beyond, because that, again, ties back to the fortunes for the likes of WPP and Meta and Google. Of course, the cloud business, interesting, given that Google's outlook on their, or Alphabet rather's outlook on their cloud business wasn't all that optimistic. Yeah, that's right. And, and again, I mean, Amazon Web Services is by far and away the market leader in cloud. And I think what we're seeing, you know, Google's the, a, a distant number three. Um, and I think Google's struggling a little bit to kind of uh, claw back market share from, from AWS um, and from Microsoft, which is the kind of number two. Um, so I think yeah, the AWS business is a strong one. It's got really good client relationships, and you know, so, so maybe there's a bit of a disconnect there between the two. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa device. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. 
I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.